Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Update Extra video giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. It's been a long day, sorry this is a little bit late. I've swapped my tea for a bit of ATP, you know, what this is actually about, a tippling philosopher. I don't advocate, of course, drinking alcohol. That's uh, wrong. But uh, yes, I think uh, it's it's about that time of day for me. Um, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to break the ice with a bit of randomness here. It's high Mars o'clock, as they say. Uh <laughs> Right. I I just jumped with the noise of that. Sorry to have blasted your ears. I mean, that, that was a high Mars rocket being shot off. This chap on a bicycle, I'm surprised he didn't fall off. Insane. Uh, yeah, I would advise not cycling near those things. Uh, just as he gets there, the thing goes off. Nice. Well done. Um, right. I'm going to just dip into a bit of Ukraine. The latest I mentioned earlier today in my news piece about, or it might have even been in the, in the front line one, I don't know, talked about Prigozhin, the idea that there's this, uh, you know, this fractious relationship between him, uh, Wagner PMC, and the Russian military, uh, actually between him and Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, and indeed him and Shoigu, uh, other people in the, in the Kremlin. I think he's only kept there because he has some kind of utility directly for uh, Putin. I think if Putin didn't have some use for him, he just wouldn't be doing and saying what he's doing and saying. Uh, lots of people are talking about, is he, I showed you images of someone holding flyers for him, uh, which look like political flyers. Is he going to challenge, uh, I don't know, Putin himself directly or other people for positions such as, you know, Secretary Minister, Defence Minister or whatever. And you might think, because we live in a particular information space we do, that Bogosian is super, super uh, popular, or at least, if not popular, then super well-known, famous in Russia. I mean, we hear about him consistently every single day, Bogosian's in the news. However, it turns out that that's really not the case. And you've got to remember that the state media in Russia has put a ban on reporting him and reporting Wagner. So whenever you, Russia are having success in Iran, Bakhmut, for example, it's the Russian armed forces doing that, even though the reality on the on the front lines is that the Wagner PMC are doing the really heavy leg legwork there and losing a lot of personnel in in doing so. Anyway, this is Ukraine, the latest with one of their reporters. In terms of Yevgeny Prigozhin and fighting with the Defense Ministry, again, this is not something that you will find out about from State TV. There's quite a bit about it. it it's, it's quite widely covered by sort of state-controlled media, but with, with a smaller reach compared to state television. Again, which is, I recently saw quite an interesting Vox Pops survey done on the streets of Moscow, where people were simply asked, do you know who Yevgeny Prigozhin is and what do you think of him? And I was quite shocked, actually, to discover that a lot of people who were approached on the street didn't even know who he was. So I would say that uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin has been extremely busy creating a media persona for himself, and he's been quite successful with that. But it doesn't seem that he's getting through to that many Russians at this point. So fascinating. Uh, and, and I can really, really believe that as well. Um, OK, talking about uh, fame in a kind of TV personality sort of way, let's go to uh, Margarita Simonian. Now, she's been on TV again. Uh, she's on TV every night, it seems. And this is what she has to say. So for those who are, who are listening, I will uh, read out subtitles. They will get uh, long range missiles. They will get them. They will get fighter jets, she says. Uh, they will use them to strike us, our territories. They will do it. And these other guys are listening. Belgorod region. They will go further. Uh, they will further go into the Voronezh region. It's not far. God forbid, forbid the Rostov region, my native Krasnodar. Uh, it would be so wonderful to stop the bloodshed right now with everyone staying where they are right now. Freeze it and then to hold referendums on all the disputed territories. Uh, and whoever people want to stay will their territory end up with. 
Um, so, you know, wherever people vote, they can, you know, stay there in, in those territories, that kind of thing. Um, she goes on to say, this is just, it's good, right? Do we need the territories who don't want to be with us? I'm not sure about it. And I imagine that the president doesn't want them either. It would be marvellous, but there's one problem. They will never agree to this. This is super, 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 super important, right? And and what's particularly important here is, uh, well, there, there are two things. The first thing is she is putting this idea out there that, uh, and, and, and that itself is a reflection of how badly the Russians are doing and then the acceptance that actually things are tough. So there's there's all that going. There are implications uh, behind what she says here. We can make inferences, but she's saying it's good and right that we put people to a referendum and they can decide their future. Wow, that's not what we've heard at all previously. So this is super super important. It's it, it's an acceptance that it, things are not looking good and things need to change. And actually, they might lose a war. And so therefore, let's here here's a really viable option: freeze referendum and actually then you could have a situation whereby you you know many territories are not kept under russian rule like the the four areas so you can imagine kherson and zaporizhia would would be voting to go back to ukraine and this is the idea that actually that's acceptable we put that to a referendum and they've they've accepted that and you could possibly even see i mean it depends whether russian citizens are kept there and how they run these kind of referendums who's in charge of them but nonetheless, that's that's a really significant shift for someone like Simonian, who has pre previously been talking in genocidal ways, right? And then the second thing, this is this is crazily important. I'm not sure about it, and I imagine that the president doesn't want them either. So this is the, so what the president doesn't want is: do we need the territories who don't want to be with us? What she's doing is being the spokesperson for Putin, putting this idea out there, being a sounding board, then see what see what the population think. Uh, they're very good at this, Russia. This is what they do all the time. They often give loads of competing narratives just to see if they fall on fertile ground and you know which which ones are good ideas and which ones are bad okay we said all this range of stuff it turns out that from because I, th I do think they do quite a lot of polling uh that we don't get to hear about um that that gives them a sense of you know what what is popular and what isn't but it's, it, the idea that, that she's kind of being a spokesperson for putin and you can be sure that this isn't by fluke she hasn't just said this off the top of her head right this has been Planned for her to to be said here, uh, and it's got the it's got the say so from the powers that be, and, and this is oh, what a great what a great way to fix her face there. Uh, this is just I I can't tell you how important I think this is, and this is allowing the idea that Putin that that it would be reasonable for Putin to sanction freezing the conflict and having referendums, and that is completely at at odds with what they have previously said. That is possibly one of the most significant things that, that I've reported in the last week, I think. Uh, that that may reflect a massive shift in uh, in Kremlin positioning there. Right. Let's and I I know no I've talked a lot about the dam, but it is it is damned important, right? Uh so damn important. Um uh, we're going to get, have a look into who is responsible for for it. There's someone's pointed me to towards a Ryan Macbeth video that's I think concluded. I haven't watched it to be honest. I haven't had time, but I think the conclusion is broadly that it may have been triggered by something else, including like a, a Ukrainian bit of shelling, uh, and that maybe set off a cascade of events that that led to the dam falling apart, blowing up, whatever but or, or falling apart maybe and that, that it's more to do with deterioration 
Uh, but the idea is that's on the Russians' watch, if you like, and they they have responsibility over the dam. They were controlling the dam, so therefore, you know, no matter what the the, the different trigger events were, it, it's their problem. Uh, but even that, there seems to be now evidence coming out that that can't be the case either. So let's have a look at this before we go on. Right, what happened to Kokovska hydroelectric power plant? Debunking the myths about self destruction. So. Uh, this uh, and lots of imagery. Uh, I'm going to kind of rush through this, but you'll get the idea, hopefully. Uh, you get a, a comparison of the flow between different time periods here. So going back to 2022, October 2022, and then June uh, 2023 before it, it blew up to get an idea of whether it, there is deterioration, whether there whether there's greater flow rates that can cause greater stress. Um you know, the site of the destruction, the upper part of the three sections for, uh, after the Russian detonation on the on n October 2022. Uh, uh, destruction of 14 section of the dam here. That's one just recently. Destruction of the part of the generator compartment and destruction of the dam between the hydroelectric power plant and the lock. So what happened? Uh, well, some believe that the dam collapsed on its own due to previous damage. Satellite images of water discharge are cited as evidence but it is enough to look at satellite images from last year before the first blow up of the hydroelectric power station uh, by the russians on the 18th of october to make sure that the pattern of the water discharge was the same and does not indicate damage to the dam for comparison a, a picture of the hydroelectric power plant on october the 15th 2022 just before the first destruction and june the 5th 2023 where there are allegedly signs of bad condition of the hydroelectric power plant um, the destruction of the hydroelectric power plant is not of a cascading nature, but zonal, and the epicenters of the destruction are far from the place of detonation on October the 18th. So where there was an explosion on October the 18th last year, uh, the idea is that this, this caused weaknesses, and therefore there's been these cascading sort of variables or cascading events that have led to the complete destruction of the dam. But actually, that doesn't doesn't really work with how the dam's constructed. So during last year's retreat, the Russians blew up the upper part of the three sluice gates on the right bank side, uh, now destroyed about 14 sections of the dam on the other side of the previous explosion. The engine room and the dam between the hydroelectric power plant and the lock. Accordingly, there is no cascading nature of destruction. The structure of the hydroelectric power plant is not monolithic. and therefore. So what it means by that is it's not one thing. That if you weaken this part, then you know things can carry on over to here, and it could fall apart over here because you've got it's just one thing, and so weaknesses in one part can affect the whole thing. Um, that is not 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 what this is about. So um, so it, therefore, the cascading nature of the disruption should not, in principle, occur. In essence, each section that holds the sluice gate is a separate reinforced concrete support. That is, damage to one support does not lead to damage to another. Metal shields are a much more vulnerable part of the dam than reinforced concrete supports, and self-destruction would have a completely different appearance. The collapse of the shields. Uh, the Russians deliberately kept the water level of the reservoir at the maximum, first to fill the reservoirs in Crimea as much as possible. So here we, we look at lots of pieces of evidence to support this you there's several ways you can do this thinking philosophically i talked a lot about abductive arguments so when you have a piece of data which hypothesis does it better support so any bit of data does it better support that it, it kind of collapsed through a series of cascading events or it was weak or whatever or the ukrainians did it so we actually we've got three three uh hypotheses the ukrainians did it outright the, the ukrainians blew it up themselves or something happened that triggered off some events that it just kind of fell apart or the Russians blew it up, right? So any single piece of data, what does that better present? So you almost, you're taking a jelly bean and you're putting it in a jar. You've got three jars. And then eventually, once you've got all the bits of data, and you've got to understand that some bits of data might be bigger jelly beans than other bits of data. So you put that in the jars and you see which jar is the fullest, right? And then you go, that it's most rational for me to assent to that hypothesis as explaining what has taken place with the dam. So, so we're doing that. Uh, I, you could do another way of doing it, which is like a Bayesian probability analysis or whatever. But let, let's go with the, the jelly bean. So you look at each bit of jelly bean. Some of it will be circumstantial evidence. Some of it will be like hard evidence and stuff. Um, so, you know, what are the bits of evidence? Well, 
att- attacking attacking armies don't blow up stuff. Defend- retreating armies do. So that goes into the Russians did it jar. Uh, you might argue over the size of the jelly bean, but it goes in there. Uh, then you got well, where it happened was a Russian control part of the dam. Okay, so that goes in the Russian hypothesis. It, it appears to have happened in from within the Russian control part of the dam, which indicates that it's it's a detonation within the dam. Okay, it goes into the Russian one. Um, uh, it seems to have been tactically more favorable to the Russians. Uh, so that goes into the Russian chart. You can say, okay, it's flooding more of the Ukrainian side, uh, the Russian occupied side than the Ukrainians. Okay, that... What do we expect from the Russians? Do they care about that? So that you might argue about what jar that bit of data goes in. Um, okay. Uh, then we have video evidence that someone's admitted to done mining the dam. Um, that goes into the Russian jar. You've got telegram written evidence that uh, someone's admitting to mining mining the dam. That goes in the Russian jar. And they were planning on doing it uh, at uh, on New Year. Um, then you've got, as I, as I said, the kind of tactical advantage that it would stop, or operational advantage, that it would stop uh, Ukrainians doing a, a counterattack or being so joining up their counteroffensive to, to launch across the river. Okay, that goes into the Russian jar. So th- what we're getting is like consistently jelly, baby, jelly beans going in the into the Russian hypothesis jar. Uh, and so we, re- we really are rational to, to, to believe this, but it, but it doesn't finish there, actually. So the, all this kind of data then feeds into the, to the Russian jar, not into the uh, cascading issues and not into the Ukrainian uh, jar, I would think, or certainly not into the cascading one in the middle. Uh, so, uh, but also check this out. So Russia filled the, the reservoir up to its highest peak it's ever been, I think, is like record highs. Why did they do that? To fill up the Crimean reservoirs. Why would you want to fill up the Crimean reservoirs? Either you are expecting the counteroffensive to take the canals or you're going to blow up the dam, in which case you're going to need as much water as you can get over there. So either way, and you know, if it's if you're going to lose that area, then that feeds into the stop the, the counteroffensive, okay, Russian jar, or it's like we, we need to fill up, fill up, the uh, the canals and our own reservoirs in, in Crimea. And once we've done that, then that, that fits circumstantially into Russia then blowing up the dam, right? Uh, so, yeah. So sec- secondly, so the, it's it's now at its record full uh, state, the, the dam, the, sorry, the reservoir, uh, it's to fill up Crimea. And then he says here, secondly, to achieve the maximum flood wave, the time of detonation was also chosen for the purpose. So if you're going to cause maximum destruction, you're going to you're going to blow it up when the dam is hot, when the reservoir is high. So the question then is, well, would would the Ukrainians want to cause maximum destruction to their own people? Like you've got to be some kind of crazy sadist to 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 do that. I mean, it's just it's, you have to really bend logic and and critical thinking to and and think really that all all Ukrainians are completely evil to do that. And of course, that's what your Russian troll does. But in reality, if you're going to objectively analyze this data, it's that's not that's not probable. So maximum devastation if if the if the reservoir is highest. Who's paying? Like this is money that that Ukraine are now having to divert from military stuff to humanitarian stuff yes they're getting some aid because of this but if you think ukraine would in them just before a counteroffensive would blow up this dam to stop them crossing Dnipro river uh, and then have to spend all their efforts time resources and money sorting out humanitarian rescue efforts and emergency rescue resources towards that than than sorting out if you think that that's more more plausible than russia did it then you've got some issues so the time of the detonation was chosen for this purpose, he says. I'm attaching a photo of the construction of the hydroelectric power plant, plant to understand the scale of the structure and safety margin. It is difficult to believe that the engine room was washed away with water. And it is not clear why it was washed away, not from the side of the previous explosion, but from the side of the left bank. The Kharkovska hydroelectric power plant cannot be destroyed in any other way than by placing a large amount of explosive charge in the base of the structure during the first detonation of the old Kharkovska hydroelectric power plant in 1941. So remember, the Soviets did have done this before. Russians have done this before. The Soviet authorities needed 20 tons of explosives. Therefore, the story about the hit on the hydroelectric power plant and the destruction of the dam by the 93 kilogram gimlers. So 
the idea that it could be done with the high mars hitting it and that's triggering off a set of cascading um you know events it's just it's pie in the sky like you need some serious explosives to do this and i know russian trolls that claim like they can even blow up the bridge with high mars right let alone a dam so it's just absolute is it's complete fanciful fiction um, it's an even bigger fiction than the story about the self-destruction. It was Russia that controlled the HPP at this time. Russia blew up the dam for the first time on October the 18th, 2022. Russia kept the water level in the reservoir at the maximum. It is impossible to believe that someone could plant several tons of explosives unnoticed by the Russians. Russia did it on, did it on purpose and tried to achieve the maximum effect for its crime. This is what a first-tier analysis looks like, uh, as says someone else. Well done. Um, but you can then add another jelly bean to this, which is evidence grows of the explosion at a collapsed Ukraine dam. So the people that think there wasn't an explosion, that it was just deterioration as a result of a bunch of things, um, maybe like a, a high Mars hitting it, that explosion wouldn't wouldn't set off seismic triggers and wouldn't be seen from spy satellites in space. However, there's now evidence that there was a big explosion just before the dam went, you know, collapsed. So uh, Reuters, but everyone's report on this evidence was growing on Friday that there was an explosion at the Kokovka Dam in southern Ukraine around the time it collapsed, according to Ukrainian and US intelligence reports and seismic data from Norway. Ukraine's security service said it had intercepted a phone call proving a Russian sabotage group blew, blew up the... And I played... Well, I, I read you a transcript to a translation that actually one of my uh, viewers has done. So there's an intercepted phone call that now also admits it. Yeah, we blew it up. But, it, but the, And they admit on that phone call that they did more damage than they were expecting. So again, which jar does that go in? Ping, Russia jar. So sabotage group blew up the Kokovka hydroelectric station and dam early on Tuesday in the Kherson region. Norway's research foundation, Norsar, said that the data collected from the regional seismic stations showed clear signals of an explosion and US spy satellites detected an explosion at the dam. A US official was quoted as saying uh, by the New York Times. So again, two other bits of data, Russia, Russia. Okay, we've got three jars. I've literally got no data to no good data no data at all to suggest that ukrainians would have done it so I chuck that jar away right could it have been a cascading set of events that that started from when the russians blew up a little bit back of the dam back in october last year and then other things and maybe ukrainians shot a high mars and that kind of triggered it all off so it's kind of the ukrainians fault but actually it's the russians fault for really keeping it in poor state of repair or whatever it's like well, virtually no evidence of that. Throw that jar away. Where are all the jelly beans? Well, they're all in one jar, pretty much, and it's a Russian jar. So, hey, the Russians did it. I have absolutely. Sometimes I'm really like cautious on where I I place my conclusions because I don't want it to come back and bite me on the ass. In 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 this occasion, all the data points to Russia doing it. And I'll be super surprised. It's not impossible that it's not Russia. Of course it's not. And it could get to a point where I have to, you know, eat my words and say, oh, I was wrong. Uh, but actually that would be given a whole new suite of evidence, which we don't have now. So right now, with all the data that we do have, it seems absolutely, like by a country mile, it's absolutely clear that the Russians did it. Now, Someone asked me, what's the Chinese reaction to this? It's such a good question. So I can't remember who it was on the threads. You know who you are. Thank you. Well, I love good questions. China expresses serious concern over Ukraine dam destruction. Uh, China expressed serious concern on June the 7th over the destruction of a major Russian-held dam in Ukraine, with Beijing saying it feared the humanitarian, economic and ecological impacts of the incident. We, ex quote, we express serious concern over the damage to the dam in the Kokovka hydroelectric power plant, uh, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said. Uh, Beijing is, quote, deeply concerned about the resulting humanitarian, economic and ecological impacts, he said. Quote, we, all, we call on all parties to the conflict to abide by international humanitarian law and do their best to protect the safety of civilians and civilian facilities, Mr. Wang said. Now, that's Chinese for we want Russia to do that. Like, be under no illusions. When they say we want, it's like both sidesism, but it's a, it's a very, it's not someone who's being both sidesist because they, they secretly actually want, want to, you know, support the bad guys or something or whatever this is a case of like saying we want both sides to be really nice here because some you know something terrible has happened hey both sides need to be nice here but it's obvious that they know that's russia and they're when they say both sides need to be nice it's actually chinese for like 
Russia needs to be nice, which is a kind of a, a just a little bit of a warning shot to Russia to say, don't do don't do stuff like this, or or don't do because if you say don't do stuff, it's a, or else. No, it's more like we're not happy with you doing that. So this is China's way of them saying we're not happy. So why might China not be happy? Is then the next question. This question or the answer to this question also answered the question is to why China don't want Russia to do nuclear missiles. And they've been very clear. When you hear public comments by the Chinese government on the war in Ukraine, they are very concerned with Russia doing nuclear. They talk more about nuclear than any other country, it seems. Why is that? My theory is that because they own somewhere around, I don't know, different figures, I've heard as much as 15% of Ukraine's agricultural land, right? And if they own that much of their land, they don't want it being radiated because actually, A, it's a that's poor return on investment. They won't get the food, you know, they won't make money out of that. And B, they won't get food production back to them. So grain or whatever. Uh, and that's super important for them. So let's have a look at some of that reasoning. This is uh, an article I've shared with you months and months and months ago. It's a Wall Street Journal article. Why does China own so much of Ukraine? So over the past few years, and again, this is you know going back to last year, but over the past few years, Chinese buyers have bought farmland in countries ranging from the US and France to Vietnam. In 2013, Hong Kong-based food giant WH Group, uh, fun fact, you used to live in Hong Kong, uh, bought Smithfield, America's largest pork producer, and more than 146,000 acres of Missouri farmland. In the same year, Jingjiang Production and Construction Corps bought, so this is one corporation, bought 9% of Ukraine's famously fertile land, equal to 5% of the country's total territory, with a 50-year lease. In 2020, the US imposed sanctions on the Chinese company over human rights abuses. Uh, between 2011 and 2020, China bought nearly 7 million hectares of farmland around the world. Firms from the UK bought nearly 2 million hectares, while US and Japanese firms bought less than 1 million hectares. I find it really interesting. The UK is like the second biggest um, buyer of land around the world. It's fascinating. I wonder what we're doing there. Anyway, quote, what matters most is what Chinese, the Chinese do with the, the land, said JP to firm a long time uh, Africa analyst who served in the Trump administration's envoy to Africa's Great Lakes region. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, quote, they got approval from the previous regime to take 100,000 hectares to produce palm oil, the cultivation of which causes damaging deforestation. And quote, and in Zimbabwe, they're producing beef for export back to China, which is neither sustainable nor wise use of farmland in a country where people go hungry for want of basic staples. China are looking after their own interests. They've got uh, a billion people. OK, it's now the second most populous country in the world. India's just overtaken it. But, you know, uh, they got it. They got a huge population that needs to be fed. <laughs> Do they have control over the requisite amount of land and resources to feed that population or do they become dependent on others and then therefore dependent on international food markets so uh, it continues loss of arable land is becoming calamitous for countries better positioned than zimbabwe by april mostly as a result of russia's invasion of ukraine holds this is april last year wholesale food process prices had risen 18 percent from a year earlier that's the largest 12 month increase in nearly five decades Bloomberg reports in France, wheat prices have doubled since 2020, and China is likely to want to buy more foreign land. It has 21% of the world's population, fifth of the world's population, but only 7% of productive farmland, which is what I was saying before. You know, They don't have enough land to feed their population. Food security, that's something they'll be hugely interested in, in sorting out to become a you know, sustainable uh, entity going forward. So if the Kokovka Dam explodes and there's water uh, destroying, you know, places and, and farmland itself, but that also stops the reservoir from being able to feed the canals that feed that massive agricultural area, then and and if some of that land is Chinese land, then that explosion directly affects Chinese China's investment. And if that land is going to struggle to produce, you know, viable yields of crop, crops, then that will directly affect China's ability to feed itself. If if they if they own some of that land, but even like feeding into the the world markets, you know, any issue in the world markets is going to affect China at, at some point. If they are buying at least some of their their produce from from elsewhere, and 
you know, 21% of the world's population, 7% of productive farmland, they're going to be dipping into world uh, food markets for sure. So they are going to be super, super peed off about this uh, from a, just from an economic point of view. So when they when they are are having to go at Russia for what's going on, you know, for, for threatening with nuclear, then you you know that they it's to do with their own self-interest. And the same here, they're going to be annoyed with Russia for doing that. But again, it's going to be a case of their own self-interest rather than from a kind of moral, ecological point of view uh, in general. Now, Chris O'Wiki says the destruction of the Kokovka Dam will cause calamitous economic and social uh, and humanitarian impacts across southern Ukraine, including the loss of much of the region's agriculture, industry and the uh, drinking water of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so let's have a look at one of his threads. Ihor uh, Pilipenko, the dean of the Kherson State University uh, or University's Faculty of Biology, Geography and Ecology, has given an interview setting out the likely impacts of the dam's destruction. Um, he ha he's previously written about the risks in the German journal Osteuropa. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, Pilipenko notes that the dam was toppled at the worst possible time just before midsummer and when the Kokovka reservoir was at a near record high its destruction now is peculiarly self-defeating given that the flooding affects the russian held side particularly badly quote the left bank suffers more than the right the right bank is high and relatively steep relatively speaking every 10 centimeters increase in the water level in of the Dnipro means 15 meters of flooding on the left bank and only three meters on the right bank uh, he notes that the volume of water released by the breach was has been enormous, between 4.5 to 5 cubic kilometers of water a day, 1.3 trillion gallons or 5 trillion liters. This is already causing huge eco ecological effects downstream and is likely to badly affect the Black Sea. We've seen images today, I'll show you in the news piece tomorrow, of widespread uh, detritus debris along the shores of the Black Sea. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, Pilipenko uh, also provides a detailed analysis of the economic impacts, particularly on agriculture, on which see also the threads linked below. The reservoir supplied water to more than 12,000 kilometers of canals. The Russian occupied Azov region uh, depends on its water supply on canals leading from the Dnipro. They will cease to flow when the water falls too low to supply them, which is already happening. Uh, the Kakovka Canal, which relied uh, on pumps lifting water from the reservoir to the height of 30 meters so there remember there are, are four canal systems uh, that feed off this reservoir and if that reservoir gets too low these canals will not be be fed um this cut the uh, this has cut the water supply to cities such as Melitopol and Berdyansk, as well as all the settlements between them, affecting 400,000 people. This canal alone supported the irrigation of about 220,000 hectares of land, 190,000 in the Kherson region, and 30,000 in the southwest of the Zaporizhia region, and the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people in the agricultural sector. As well as cutting off drinking water supplies, the loss of the reservoir may shut down water-hungry industries, such as the metallurgical facilities at Nikopol, which are on the Ukrainian side of the Dnipro. Uh, the North Crimean Canal, which supplies 85% of Crimea's water, will not function when the water level falls below about 10 metres. At current outflow rates, this will happen by Sunday, apart from some aquifers in the Oleshki Sands area. Uh, the region is otherwise arid. Uh, Pilipenko notes that annual rainfall in the Azov region is only 350, 350 millimetres, while evaporation amounts to 1,000 to 1,100 millimetres. It will dry out very quickly within a single season. Crops grown for livestock, feed and exports such as soybeans and onions will no longer be viable. This has grave effects for the human population. 150,000 to 200,000 people are forecast to lose their jobs in the Kherson region alone. Many towns and villages will no longer be economically viable. Up to 420,000 agricultural jobs are potentially at risk. Now, remember, if China own a bunch of that land, that's going to affect them. But just in general, this affects all of us, not only the people living there and, and the ecology and the environment and the agriculture there, but food production for the world. Um, the region's population grew by 340% after the canals were built between the 1950s and 1980s due to the increased water supply and agricultural opportunities. Pilipenko estimates that the population of only 
half as much as is now sustainable. The right bank region around the city of Kherson will be less affected. Again, when you when you take all of this information into account, which where are you going to put your jelly bean? If Ukraine, right, want their country and they envisage having their country back, right? They they are talking about getting the Ukrainians out of Crimea. Why would they do this to themselves? Why would they destroy one of their the biggest industries? Why would they destroy the livelihoods of all those people and the future of that whole area? Just why would they do that? But there's no sense to thinking Ukraine would do this. Uh, the right bank region uh, around the city of Kherson will be less affected as it depends primarily on locally supplied but poor quality water from the Indialets River rather than Dnipro. That said, Dnipro water was used to irrigate a radius of around 40 kilometers from Kherson. Crimea will be, a very, will be very severely affected as it was before when Ukraine cut off the water supply in 2014. And I've shown you these two uh, images before. So if that's 2014 or at least, uh, was it 2016? A couple of years after they cut off the water supply, this is Crimea being very green. And then this is the same map. Uh, I can't remember when this was, um, but you can see the devastating effect on Crimea that turning off the water has had. Well, that would be the same for the whole region now. In February 2021, the Simferopol Reservoir was only 7% full. Arable land fell from 130,000 hectares in 2013, a fraction of Soviet-era levels, to 14,000 in uh, 2017. So it's down to 10% of, of, of what it was in 2013. Unlike the concrete-lined Kakovka Canal, the North Crimean Canal, which is built in a much simpler and therefore cheaper fashion in the Khrushchev era, um, has a bed of earth. It drains completely by the end of the irrigation season, so it will be empty in a few weeks. Uh, it's just terrible. So before 2014, Crimea used over 700 million cubic litres of water during a relatively short irrigation period, spring and summer. When Russia launched a February 22 invasion of Ukraine, it unblocked the North Crimean Canal almost immediately to restore the water flow. Nonetheless, despite the high-profile relaunch of irrigation by Crimea's governor, Sergei uh, Aksinov, in April 2022, the water flow was only restored to 80 million cubic litres and the amount of arable land increased only to 25,000 hectares. During the recent years of drought, the irrigation infrastructure in Crimea was reportedly almost completely lost, funded, and required the expenditure of 14.5 billion rubles to restore. That's $177 million. This year, Crimea planned to increase the area under cultivation to 40,000 hectares and to bring more than 300 million cubic meters. Uh, I think is that litres, through the canal. Now the water has been cut off entirely, plunging Crimean far farmers into long-term crisis. Pilipenko is hopeful that the dam can be restored within three years. The Soviets took five years to build it due to improved construction technology. The reservoir itself will take a year to refill, but this will depend on peace being restored. Quote, in case of a negative scenario, of course, nothing can be restored without irrigation uh, nothing can be restored. Without irrigation, there will be no supply of drinking water. There will be, again, the situation of the 1930s to 50s of the last century, a sparse, small population, sparse villages, imported water. Huge ramifications to this, huge ramifications. And again, what hypothesis does it better support? I think the Russians made a decision. It, it, it doesn't really help anyone but it helped the Russians marginally in the short term more than, or quite a lot in the short term, more than the Ukrainians. So if you're talking about the counteroffensive, this was, a, this was a, scare quotes, a good move by the Russians. If you're talking about like going forward, if the Russians intend on keeping Crimea and occupy Kherson, they're, they, they screwed themselves. And if Ukraine uh, had done this, they've screwed themselves even more because this is their, their long-term idea is to obviously have all their territories back. So, Absolutely insane decision. Absolutely insane. Um, on a more positive note, I guess, this dog has travelled on a raft more than 140 kilometres, at the very least, from the flooded area in Kherson Oblast to the Black Sea shore in Hiroyevka, uh, Desert Oblast, southern Ukraine. It's hard to imagine what the dog went through. And we're starting to hear lots of claims about uh, dead bodies now sort of turning up. It's not looking good uh, for the human impact of the flooding either okay uh the last thing i'm going to do today is just talk just a really short couple of minutes on trolls 
Uh, some people say, why do you spend so much time on trolls and blah, blah, blah. I just can't help it. I, I do like a bit of troll troll baiting or troll arguing. Hey, you know, it's my own kind of form of sadism. Right. It's just how to, how to, if you remember from my video on trolls, troll farms and bot farms, I said how to spot a Russian troll. What they will do is they will announce part of their identity to you in the first comment they ever put on your on your platform and that will be an, a, an attempt to get someone who shares those identities to uh, feel for them and identify with them and then they come up with uh, stuff that's maybe against what you might think and then you have this dissonance of like well I'm like that too so quite often you hear I, I've had someone say I'm a black American but I won't vote and I voted for Biden and I won't vote for him ever again it's the first thing you ever said why well, have you announced that you're a black American on here and I'm like, well, what's the point of doing that like Okay, so I understand you're trying to get identity. So you might talk about your sexuality. You might talk about where you're from. You might talk about, uh, you know, working class woman or this. You know, some kind of identity uh, announcement to to the platform is is how you get people to attach themselves to you uh, and associate with you, and then and then you drive in your wedge, right? So this one turned up today on my frontline uh, video, uh, and it's great. It's like, is it a shit sandwich? No, it's it's not quite like that. It's it's like I'm going to say so. An SH1T sandwich is you say something nice, say something horrible, say something nice, and you know you use that quite a lot in management and stuff. Anyway, uh, this is like, hey, it's not too biased. It was okay. So this is a Russian troll. This is like, so I go, oh, oh, thanks. I, I guess it's quite nice. Right, let's see what you have to say. And then he says, Bruan Berletic is is more accurate, and I have a feeling that's just a pro-Russian um, there. And he says, and is the Ukrainian bloke. Dennis something, as if he doesn't know who Dennis Dad Davidov is, right? I forget his name. Really? Really? If, you, if you're spending all your time on these, you, you know who he is. But alas, you are too optimistic. I am English. I live in Bath, Somerset, right? Now, ask yourself this. Have you ever in your life, in the very first comment of any blog or wherever you've gone platform, announced where you're from and then give me more information, give the, the people more information about that. So it's not just I'm English or I'm from Bath. It's I'm English. I'm from Bath in Somerset. So that tells you that I know what I'm talking about and I know these English places and it's evidence that I'm English, right? I'm English. I'm from Bath, Somerset in England, right? Yeah, yeah. No, you're from Moscow, you dingbat. Uh, I see nurses on strike that we cannot pay for. I see strikes everywhere for more money than we cannot pay for. This is low rubbish. But we have already paid £7 billion. I have had enough of all you pro-Western media whooping it up while our eight elderly pension pensioners, I mean, it's, yeah, are dying because they cannot heat their homes in winter. That never happened. No one in England has said that. Like, we, we had, a, we had uh, an energy crisis and a... Um, uh, we've had a cost of living crisis, but the government had to step in. We had to do X, Y, and Z. So that didn't happen. Like you, the Russians wanted that to happen. They brought out the adverts about this. But so anyway, our ex-servicemen on the streets because they don't have homes. That doesn't happen in the UK. If you lived in the UK, you know that, yeah, that happens a little bit, but it's not like America with their, with their veterans where that is a serious problem. I mean, we do have issues with mental health and alcohol and stuff, but that isn't a well-known huge problem, having ex-servicemen homeless. So. I think you would only say that. I've never, I've never in my life heard an English person say that. Put it that way. This is just not something to say. You whip it up, go boys. I mean, the English is poor here. Let's bring the F-16s. Let's put NATO boots on the ground. But you scum will not be going to your deaths. It will be our young men, sons and brothers. I hate war. I hate you all. I live in Bath, England. I will fight you outside a bar of your choosing. I mean, it's just a bizarre, bizarre comment. And I just said, interesting, because your comment reads exactly like a Russian troll comment, as discussed in my video on this topic. I have absolutely heaps of English commenters here, and not one of them has told me where they are from in England in the very first comment. You are too obviously following the troll, troll pro forma. In fact, I have told someone where I, uh, I was from only when they've asked me, oh, where are you from? And I asked someone today, oh, where are you from? Because uh, they've mentioned that being from the South Coast that was contextually important to the thread they're on, not just an open thing like their first comment, oh, I'm from the South Coast. It was like relevant to, to the thread. And I was like, oh, where are you from the South Coast? Oh, because I'm from the South Coast. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. That's when you, 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 you give people that information. You don't do it in your very first comment. So this is just, a, just an interesting little um, uh, indication for you all 
if if any Russian says to you, or if any commenter, Russian, if any commenter says to you in the very first comment some big identifier information, usually geographical, but not always. It might be sort of ethnic, cultural, um, whatever, some other identifier. You can bet your bottom dollar it's a Russian troll. And you can bet that that eventually their comment will be slagging off something to do with the country they claim to be from uh, and slagging off the war effort, so on and so forth. And that's exactly what that was. So I just thought that was worth uh, worth looking at. Uh, anyway, uh, that's all for today. I just thought I'd end with some troll. Uh, they are out in force today. Goodness, are they out in force. What does that tell you? I was speaking to my partner earlier about... Um, about troll behavior. And I said, you know, something is happening on the front line. I mean, she didn't care. I mean, not to the depth I do. She's like glazing over. I was like, you know, something's happening on the front line. You know, things are happening in this war when you have a day where the trolls are out in force. And today they are infesting uh, my thread. And I'm sure everyone threads who, who deals with this kind of stuff. And the, what does that tell you? Are they panicking? Uh, are they trying to? Why are they trying to control the information space so much more today? Interesting. Anyway, take care. Really appreciate all your support. Thank you so much. Um, you are awesome, team. Uh, I will speak to you tomorrow. But in the meantime, uh, two little pips, and I'm going to enjoy the rest of my glass of wine on a beautiful evening. It's been a lovely sunny day. I've watched my boy play football. They went out in the quarterfinals, even though they're the best team there. I have to say that, but it's true. It's seven minute games, anything can happen. Uh, ridiculous, those kind of short game tournaments. So, you know, and it's like, oh, well, hey, it doesn't matter, mate. It doesn't matter, mate. Come home. Come home. I need a glass of wine. And so uh, here we are. Uh, take care. Speak soon.